My name is Alan Moore, and I am a front-end engineer at a company called TenUp. Uh, I am going to be talking about, um, my title is a Need for Speed Performance-Driven Front-End Development. What we're going to be talking about is creating fast, engaging environments for our users that load fast in the browser. It's something that we all think about and is something that can at times be very hard to pull off. There are a lot of gotchas in the way when we start working with the browser, the technologies that we love to use, so we're going to look at some ways that we can overcome those. This is where you can find me on Twitter at Creative Allen. Uh, my personal blog is allenmore.me. And GitHub, you can see things that I've contributed to. The list isn't super long, um, but github.com slash allenmore. And uh, as I said, I work for a company called TenUp, and there's a great little website out there, is tenuphiring.com. And yes, we're hiring. We're looking for quality system admins, uh, web engineers, front-end engineers, people that work with accounts. Particularly right now, our biggest need is people in project management, uh, lead people that have ability to lead teams and work with clients. If that's you, I would love to talk with you. My coworker Adam is here also, and he would love to talk with you also. We are looking for quality people. We are fully distributed. We are, uh, have 150 employees worldwide, and we would love to have you a part of our team. So let's get started. How society has shaped the web. So the first question I like to ask is, how many of you have ever visited a website, preferably one that you did not write code for? And as you're going through the site, whether it's on a device, a uh, mobile device, or on your computer, you have that immediate user frustration where the site's slow, something isn't loading. Maybe you're, they have one of those great uh, sliders and carousels that you should not have on your website and you click the button and it doesn't do anything. And then five seconds later, it finally decides at its own time, at its own choosing, that it's gonna progress for you. How many of you ever had that situation? And immediately you're just like, ah, oh, I'm leaving your website. That's what I do. If your site loads slow, I'm gone. Because I just, I want it fast. I want it now. Um, society has shaped that. I think of, you know, we can drive through a, a, a drive through right now, get a cup of coffee, coffee, keep going. I can drive through a drive through and get a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich and keep rolling. And, and there's nothing that stops me. So how has society shaped this? From the dawn of time, people have sought after faster ways to do things, from means of transportation to pizza being delivered. We think about all these things. Today's web user is no different. Content should be delivered and rendered at the click of a button or at the refresh of a screen. Any type of delay will result in frustration and a quick exit. Um, these are all instances from where the wheel was first developed to horses, to the steam engine, to the first car, to jets, to race cars, to the shuttle, to the TARDIS, and then the great Ricky Bobby. These are all fast instances. We want things fast. Have you ever, if you think about in the realm of a race car, maybe a drag car, if you're driving down that straightaway, Every obstacle in the way of the car is something that's going to cause it to slow down. That's the way that websites work too. Everything that's in the way causes a delay. As developers, that's things we have to work on. Um, Front-end engineers and back-end engineers. That's why we're going to look at how the browser loads a web page. So, have you ever looked at how your browser loads something? Have you ever really investigated that? how it happens from when you first navigate to a URL to the site fully paints and renders. Have you ever looked at how that browser loads? This is how it happens. You um, enter that URL, URL, the browser starts to download an HTML file. And then it starts parsing through the HTML. And then it encounters something that it has to load, which it could be an image, JavaScript file, CSS file, et cetera. It could be more things. Well, in the case of all of these, it has to load the external resource, whether it's locally um, on that URL's uh, server or it's on a CDN or someone, something externally. And in some cases, it has to parse that external resource. JavaScript file, CSS, for instance. And then it continues to parse the HTML until it encounters another resource that must be loaded. So the scary thought about this is we have a tendency to load up all the things. 
every cool thing that we can think about to put on a site without thinking about the end result, without thinking about what it can do to the site. The more JavaScript files you load, the more CSS files you load, the more images you load, the slower your site can, lo can load in the long run, um, especially if we're loading those in the header. Uh, it becomes render blocking. And um, that can be an issue, especially I I've seen instances where I like to run a web page test um, as I'm doing an audit on performance for one of our clients. And before we ever hit that body tag, that first open and body tag, there are 70 external resources being loaded. This is prior to us even starting to write code. This is looking at their existing site. And that's already a way that I know we can provide a better experience for our client is get rid of all those things that are loading. We're going to first talk about the critical rendering path. And you probably see a newspaper sitting up here and you're like, why did he leave his newspaper up here? But there's a particular re reason for this. So one of, the, um, one of the great marketing terms that we've had come out in the last few years is the above the fold content. I want to have as much as possible in the above the fold. I want to have this slider in the above the fold. Um, is this, that term comes from this. It comes from the newspaper. If you think about through time, some of the most important headlines that we've ever seen prior to the digital world coming into play with news were in the, was in the paper. The most important news of the day, the most important thing that we had going on was right here in the above the fold. So in the New York Times today, it's talking about China's, China's global ambitions. And it also talks about the president um, visiting uh, a memorial in Kenya. Those are important news for our day. Those are the things that is the above the fold content. These are, this is actually translates over to the web also. Uh, for your clients, for your users, for yourself, the thing that you want to have, the most, that you want to say first and foremost, is right there when the browser renders. The above the fold content, the critical rendering path, is the first thing that the user sees and experience. And um, that's something that we have ways of going about it to prioritize that. Um, up until about seven, eight months ago, it was something that I would probably consider very bleeding edge of the cutting edge. It was kind of scary how we're going to figure that out and get it there. But today, we're going to be talking about ways that we can overcome that a little bit later on. I'm going to give you some code examples. But let's talk about what the critical rendering path is. Google defines the critical rendering path as the code and resources required to render the initial view of a web page. That is, as I said, the first thing that the user sees when they navigate to your website. That is the first thing in the, in the browser, whether it's an iPhone, an Android device, or a computer. Um, how front-end performance affects user engagement and experience. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, user frustration. It, it is very frustrating. We, we've all had those times where we've experienced that frustration, but have you ever thought about and, and really went through what your user is going through on your site? Sat down and thought about. Now, if, you're, if your area is user experience, then thank you because we need you. We really need you. Um, our company has, I didn't mention this area too, user experience. If you're in user experience, we would love to talk with you. That has made all the difference in the world when I think something makes sense, but then one of the user experience designers comes behind me and goes, hey, that's awesome, but let's correct that because the user is going to expect this and this can cause a problem. Um, speed is the same way. How the site loads is, this, is just as much a user experience issue as not being able to click a button on a site. Frustration is defined as a feeling of anger or annoyance caused by being an, unable to do something. This is how Webster's uh, Dictionary defines um, frustration. Front-end performance has a lasting effect. The content that ourselves or our clients are trying to present can be quickly blocked, passed by, or never seen when performance is a problem. This could be a breaking news story, a featured article, an upcoming event, an ad that brings in revenue, and so much more. If you think in that light, front-end performance should never be the bottleneck. 
I think about a lot of the clients that I deal with on a day-to-day basis. A lot of our clients, I would say most of our clients, a lot of the, the, their primary revenue comes in through ad sales, whether it's a radio station that I'm working with, whether it's a online publisher, they have ads that bring in revenue. If the code that I write, if the site that I help to develop is performing at a um, slow pace, that's one less ad that will be seen. That's one less impression that the user will see. That's one less possible dollar that my client is making. And that has a lasting effect. If you add that up over millions of visitors, that's a lot of money. Our job, our responsibility, is to make sure that our clients make money off what we're providing them. If our job is, the, if we're the ones who make the money, if we're the ones who, if that is our site, we want the same type of situation. We want the people who work with us and partner with us to see that as an important piece of the puzzle. Performance and accessibility. Um, performance has a even bigger toll on accessibility. I think about my time at NC State. There's um, one of my coworkers that I work with at North Carolina State University is here. And there was a big push in that last year at North Carolina State University on accessibility of making the every site that the university had be accessible to all. Um, performance has, has an effect on that also. Web accessibility refers to the inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites with people with disabilities. When sites are correctly designed, developed, and edited, all users have equal access to information and functionality. We live in a time where information is available to all and it should be for all. Performance must never block a user with a disability from accessing that information. Our development process must include a workflow that seeks to include users of all types on all devices. This is something that I, I still feel that as developers, we, we don't put the importance that we should on it. Um, at our summit we had for, um, for the company I work with, one of our teammates, Dave, Rose, Dave Rawls, spoke about accessibility. And one of the things that he referenced that is important, it's very close to me, it's something that I find to be important, is accessibility, and a lot of people would think this isn't an issue, but it is, and I'm gonna speak from very first-hand basis, and I'm very open and honest about it, is people with attention deficit disorder, ADHD, um, how accessibility, how sites affect them. That's something that I face, and that's something that, that I deal with. I, if you were to go to my blog, you would see blog posts about life as an adult with ADD. Websites affect that, particularly websites where there's a lot of interaction, a lot of things going on at the same time. They affect me. They also affect performance at the same time. And how, if those things start to lag, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a weird situation because if there's too much interaction going on, I get diverted. But if the interaction has issues and it moves slow and there's performance issue, it affects me the same way. But I also think of the user who has vision issues. I think of the user who may, may not be able to see at all. They have the right, just as much as I do, to visit that site and interact with that content. And the code that I write should not be a blocker for that. What we do as developers should never be a blocker for that. Performing, performance dri driven front end development best practices. So, these are, a lot of these are based on the best practices that the company I work for has put together. They're also thoughts that I have. And also, as I go, if you have any questions, you have any thoughts, if you have any additions, please don't hesitate to speak up and add in. Um, I love people to be involved while I'm doing my talks. The first thing is, if you don't need it, don't load it. Um, this can span the globe from style sheets, JavaScript files, even content. Um, should you be loading a JavaScript file for a gallery on the front page of your site when the gallery is buried three pages deep? Um, these are the questions we have to ask as we develop. Um, and this, we can use something like is singular for items that should only load on a single page or a post. 
for those galleries I mentioned, something that we've been doing on my team is we, cr- we create a, condi- uh, a, con- a custom conditional or hook that will check if the gallery's present. If that gallery's present, the JavaScript and the CSS will load up. And that prevents, that, that's one to two less files that have to load up before that content is loaded up. That's one less thing that the browser has to deal with in the long run. This is an example. This is an example that any theme that you've probably worked on or seen that has comments, this is the standard way to load up the um, comment reply script. If it is singular, singular, comments are open, get the option threaded comments, then we're going to throw this in. Um, it's something that we can really work on. This is something that I would also love to see. I'm going to go <coughs> hint, hint, Adam, um, for the, or the people in here that work on core. I would love to see a way that we could do this uh, natively in WordPress for styles so that we don't have to load those up all the time um, or be able to throw those in the footer without having to just unqueue it and let all the things go. Um, you can do is singular for style sheets, but then I'm also dealing with the fact that I've got multiple style sheets. So it's like there's little issues either way. Um, wait till later. And this is defer, async, use the footer. Um, so I spoke about this particular, um, t- uh, this particular area at WordCamp Philly, and one of the statements I made, and the, a, a guy came up to me after, he's like, what do you mean that we should do this? I get really upset with plugin developers um, who have a JavaScript file that they need, and they just, they don't allow it to go in the footer, and they just throw it in the header, and that's one more thing that I have to deal with. Um, or they give me a setting that says, hey, would you like to put this in the footer or would you like it in the header? And it actually doesn't work. Or it tries to detect the content and that doesn't work. Um, in, our, in our themes, our plugins, whatever we're working on, if we don't need that file, throw it in the footer. If you don't need that JavaScript file, and if you can async that JavaScript file, then do it. I'm going to show you a way that you can do that um, in some code examples natively in WordPress, using some new hooks that we have, some new filters, new actions, that you can do this, and it will not mess up your code. Um, and you'll still be able to unqueue your JavaScript files just like normal. The bare necessities, the initial rendering. Um, what is needed to make the initial render of a site load quickly and smoothly? Is it necessary for you to load the styles for your footer at the very start of your website if it's not going to be seen initially? Should you do that? That's more CSS that we have to deal with. If you don't need it, don't load it. And so I mentioned this earlier. Um, this is one of the mottos I go by. It's great to be on the cutting edge, but it's never okay to be on the bleeding edge of the cutting edge. And so what that means is it's okay to do cutting edge things, but if it's on that bleeding edge side, which means there's so many chances it can fail, then we shouldn't do it. Now, I threw this in because what I'm getting ready to start talking about is still pretty cutting edge. It still can be considered by some on the bleeding edge of the cutting edge, but it's something that I've got a very large, pro- large project I'm working on that this is going to be something we're utilizing, and it's something that could be a standard at our company very soon. Um, this is called, it's loading the critical render, rendering path styles in line in the header and all else either in the footer or loading it asynchronously with JavaScript. So let's talk about how we can do this. Something now I may smile a lot is something I'm really excited about because this is something that Google, if you do PageSpeed Insights, um, if you do the scores on your website, most websites that people run this test on, they fail this situation. Um, the reason why is how many of you, so how many of you do front end development? So let's say that you're, you're, you're writing the CSS for a site. First off, do you want to have to manually determine what styles are critical for that initial render view? And once you do, after you've gone through that process of determining that, do you want to have to manually deal with two different style sheets? If you make a change to this one, you may have to make a change with this one. And then with loading it in line, you've got to cut and paste that, possibly either put it in a header, put it in a function. And then every time you make a major change, you have to do that again. That's why I would consider this bleeding edge, but I'm getting ready to show you a way that we can overcome that. 
Thank you to the great people at the Filament Group. We have a new process that works either by itself um, called Critical CSS, or you can use it as a grunt or, grunt or gulp task. And what this does is, when you add this to your grunt, and so all my examples are going to be using grunt, so just FYI as you look at these. Um, when I add this process, uh, this task to my grunt um, file, I can parse a local domain. It uses uh, PhantomJS, so it's a headless browser. So I put in my URL. I say, okay, I'd like for my width and my height that we're going to prioritize to be 1,200 pixels wide, 900 pixels high. I want to output a new file here. This is the file name is the CSS style sheet that's being used for the site. We have a buffer um, just to make sure if the, in case it, it, it's for file size so we don't get an extremely large file size. And then ignore console. Um, that's so if there's any console error logs, we can ignore that for right now and we'll go back and figure out those issues. So I can run this and this is for a home page. And the cool thing about this is I can run multiple options. So if I want to do an article, I can generate a separate style sheet for an article. And that way, if the user goes to an article or a gallery, they have all the styles that are necessary. So this looks well and good. We've generated some style sheets, right? We run that by, I normally create a separate task just called critical, so I can type in grunt critical. So this does not have to run every time I run my standard grunt task because that's going to take a little bit. And then we, when we run grunt critical, we get this. It generates file, uh, style sheets for each of these. It goes in, parses the style sheets. And the cool thing about this is it takes into account media queries. It takes into account that. So if you go and do page speed insights on your site, you're going to find that not only on mobile, but on desktop, um, the above the fold content has been prioritized for both. So now we have style sheets, right? But how are we going to deal with that? Here's what the style sheet would look like, just a standard inline style sheet. And then we would go and use a cool little function that the um, that filament groups put out. Uh, it's called load CSS. And what this does is, after your site has, thank you very much, some of the colors, yeah. maybe a little bit dark. Yeah. And I'll, there, I'll put this information and make it available to you guys. Um, there's going to be a link for this. But with this, what this is doing, this is asynchronously creating a um, link to your style sheet. When um, the browser goes through your site, it is not considered this render blocking. That's why we're inlining before this. this. These styles that we have here, these are just test styles. What I do with this is I have a PHP function that runs conditionals. And if it's a front page, it gives me the um, critical for the home. If it's a uh, article, single, um, it loads up the style sheet for that. And if it is a um, page, it gives me that, and so on and so forth. The more content, the more of these I possibly have. Yes, sir? So, so those are loading separate style sheets. You're writing separate. Yes. So what I'm doing is I have a standard style sheet. I'm doing include once with a link to the, um, with a reference to the style sheet. And then it includes it in line. It's, I've got, I didn't show this in this because the fact of like it's a lot of code to show. But in that style, I will um, open up PHP and then do, do include once with a reference to the style sheet. And then it will load all those styles within the style bracket, uh, the style open and closing elements. And then run the conditionals also to check and make sure I'm getting the correct one. This is something that if you go to my website, alanmore.me, you'll see something is actually happening there. Um, the, if you go to an article, you'll see it's separate styles. They are minified. So I, in part of my grunt task, uh, the, minify, uh, the CSS min option, I minify the styles that are being generated so that I'm loading up minified at all time. And in a lot of our situations, our company, the server's doing that for us, but this is another level of it. It's less that it has to deal with in the long run. And then this is low. The, the reason that I've had some questions as to why I'm using a function like this to create the CSS, I mean, the, the link to the style sheet. The reason why is if for some reason something fails, if for some reason something does not get included 
in that critical style sheet, I still have the style sheet being loaded. And uh, it's about a one to one and a half second delay after um, the site renders up that I get the style sheet also. So there's no, at the end result, the user is still getting everything that they need. But I've prioritized everything that should be sent first and seen first. And then below that, you'll see a no script option in case for some reason, as Adam mentioned yesterday, somebody has JavaScript turned off. And we have situations where that can happen. We have a link to the style sheet. Any questions on this? Yes. So that's what this process does. The grunt task does that for you. Okay. So what it does with um, loading up the headless browser, it renders your site. It looks at everything that initially loads in that screen resolution, oh, okay. and it generates, pulls all the styles out of that and puts it into a style sheet for you. Oh, that's, awesome. okay. it, that's, why it, it, that's why I didn't want to deal with this for quite a while right. because I didn't want to have to sit there and look at a site and figure out all the styles that I needed to make it work. This takes that, that need to do that out of it for me. So when you do that first generation, you have the media query running, right? So it's yeah. based on a certain size. What happens when the browser, when it's loaded on mobile, for example, and you generated that critical style for a desktop? Are there different styles generated? For no, it's, it pulls all the media queries into the same okay. file. Okay, so it has the media queries. Yep, the yep. So you're not having to do something like uh, match media. But it prioritizes the size that you gave it? That's, you that's, the, um, that's the max size we're prioritizing. So what I've done, like, so the 1200 by 900 that you see here mm -hmm. is based on, that's, not only is that the default, that's based on national average for browser sizes that um, the average user uses. Now, with your clients, this should be a case-by-case -case basis based on the users they have to their site. So one particular site that I'm working on now, uh, about 60% of their users are Android users and mobile, so it very weird different sizes because one thing Android gives us is a lot of different screen resolutions. So we're coming up with a kind of average between that to prioritize. So it's not generating, you're not getting one for mobile, you're not getting one for desktop. You're getting still one generated style sheet. And, and this is the way that we develop, we do mobile first, so it's styles, and then for that min width up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, was the, I guess I got a little lost on why there is a width and height there. I'm not sure what that is. So what that's doing is with, um, with PhantomJS, it's, instead of this actually loading up your browser, it's loading what's called a, a headless browser. It's kind of, it's loading up a browser, you don't actually see it happen. When this task right here runs, so when it says running critical home, it's running a task that, gener that pulls up a browser that's 1,200 pixels wide by 900 pixels high, and it's pulling all the styles that are need for that, needed for that size. So you're saying, okay, when the, I want to generate styles that are minimum for this. So where I could find this to be very important is thinking in the realm of... Um, how we deal with, deal with tablets. Everybody's approach to dealing with tablets is, it's a little bit different. Do I give the user who is on landscape on a tablet, do I give them a hamburger icon and an off canvas menu? Or do I provide a drop down that doesn't even work correct on tablet because it's based on hover for a lot of people? So by doing this 1200 by 900, I'm going a little bit larger than the standard tablet sizes. That's also something that's a little bit smaller than the average laptop screen size, and I'm pro prioritizing all of that. I could be that guy who goes, man, I have a 1920 by 1080 monitor, or my new one that's coming in that should be sitting in my house right now that's 27 inches, that's 2560, I believe. I could be that guy who says, that's what I'm prioritizing because that's what I have at home. There's a problem with that. How many of my users actually have that? Not a lot. So I prioritize based on what my clients, users have, or in an instance like my personal project on my, like my site, I prioritize based on the national average, the national average of screen sizes. So 1200 by 900 is a little bit larger than that. 
and it's a little bit wider than that. That way, if somebody's got a screen a little bit larger, they're still getting all the styles and the sizes that they need. Is there um, any kind of flash of style of content? No. No, there's not. Um, because it's in the head, nothing has to be, it's being parsed just like HTML is. The browser sees it, pulls it, keeps rolling. It's not having to go through another file and parse that one. So it's, it's beautiful. It's fast. And in this case, too, I also, um, if, the, if the file allow, allows it for font files, so we don't have like a flash of style, unstyled content, because you can deal with that with um, font files, I load my font files locally. Um, I don't deal with an external CDN. And the re if, as I said, if it allows that. And the reason for that is, so let's take Google Fonts, for instance. How many use Google Fonts? How many of you have ever looked at your browser and seen that link that is being added? It's a CSS style sheet. You open it up in your browser. Have you ever looked at that CSS style sheet and see what's happening? It's now calling, let's say you have two fonts. So you've got one that's for your body. Let's say you're using a serif font. And with that serif font, you're providing a normal uh, font size. Possibly you need to do like an italic with that. And then you're doing a bold. So that's three possible sizes that we have to deal with, styles. And then you're doing something for maybe a header, so a sans serif font. Same situation. Maybe normal, italic, and then bold. So that's three. So that's six fonts we're dealing with. If you look at Google's um, style sheet, that's six DNS calls that your browser is having to deal with. That's six outbound resources it has to go pull in and bring back and parse. So if I load it locally, we don't have that situation. So, and, and, and with this situation too, with, with, with this type of an example, that's being pulled into that um, above the fold content styles because it sees it. Especially like Font Awesome, you're dealing with that. You're having to like call another CDN. We're getting rid of those. We're getting those roadblocks on. And um, your sysadmins will love you because that's less bandwidth they're having to deal with. It's all right there locally. Any other questions? And slow me down if I start talking fast. My southern comes out really quick, and I start flying. And as I said, um, the filament group, has, there's a gulp version of this. And um, I'll make sure I get you guys links to all that. I'll put it up on my um, website. And um, we're going to talk about, uh, I mentioned earlier about asyncing JavaScript. So this is something that we've all seen, right? on queuing our JavaScript files. Um, this is something that I mentioned earlier. So this little word here where it says true, this means we're going to throw it in the footer, right? Stop putting faults there unless, if you don't need to. Please, please, thank you. Sorry, and I move a lot. I'm sorry, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, so this is the way that we will normally on queue a JavaScript file. And um, we have a new filter as of, I believe this is 4.1. Um, called the script loader tag. And what this allows me to do is a world of things. In this instance, we're going to add a async option to a JavaScript file. So what first thing I do is we do a search for the handle. So I say, if, it's, if this is not theme script, please return the tag because I don't want to affect every other JavaScript file that's being loaded on my site, that's being on queued. Um, if that's the case, just return the tag, don't break anything. After that, we're going to do return script replace, and we're going to look for script. And I'm going to throw an async option in and then say, hey, do this with the tag that I am calling. And then we add that filter. And I am able to then um, very easily add an async option to any of my JavaScript files. I just use this with a client who, and the reason I learned about this, so I'm going to give props to one of, the, uh, one of our senior web engineers on my team, um, Mary Cadwell, she introduced this to me. We were working on a project for a client, and they needed to load a JavaScript file that had a data ID attached to it, and it needed to be async. I'm like, okay, so the way we do this normally is we do like add the JavaScript file, like do script, throw it in WP footer. She's like, yeah, but I got a better way you can do this. Let me introduce you to script loader tag. I'm like, wow, what is this? And she shows me, I'm like, mind blown. Really, where did this come from? And I was able to 
pull the option that we added to um, their uh, site options that had the data ID, and then also async it, feed that into the script call, and uh, at the same time on queue their JavaScript file. So I'm doing things the native WordPress way, I'm doing things the way we should be doing it natively, and um, it also made me think about ways that I can go change things that plugin developers are doing on my personal site and make things async if I want to. So uh, this is a beautiful little tag that we can use. How many of you have used this before? Woohoo! Touch something new. Love that. Sorry, I get excited when I get to do that. I love to pass the knowledge on. So, tools to measure front end performance. How many of you, when you're developing, you're constantly like looking at the performance of your site? How many of you maybe use a performance budget? Cool. Okay, two. That's good. That's good. How many know what a performance budget is? Okay, so two. So a performance budget is, it's basically, as the word said, it's a budget for performance. We're looking at how our site loads. We're, we're specifying um, what we want, how we want our site to load, how fast we want it to load. We're comparing it with other, um, with other possible competitors. So if you're looking at, let's say maybe you're ESPN. We would compare ESPN to possibly like Fox Sports and they would be comparables. So we would base that performance on them and we would say, okay, we want this site to load in three seconds. I want the critical rendering path, I want the DOM to be rendered, I want the site to be rendered in this time. And we set that as a performance budget and as we're um, running tests on our site, that's our end result. And we're making changes based on that budget, based on that end goal. That's what a performance budget is. And these are some tools that I'm getting ready to show you that we can do that with, also things that we'll be doing in the browser. So the first thing I encourage you to start using is your browser dev tools. Um, one of my favorite options that Chrome has is the timeline option. You can get a visual of how your site renders and paints. You can also see the blockers and the issues. But I also encourage you is to break out of the Chrome bubble. Uh, a lot of developers use Chrome exclusively. And that's not fair to our user. Uh, we need to use Safari. We need to use Firefox, <clears throat> need to use Internet Explorer. <laughs> so, and not just Internet Explorer, the latest version, older versions. You've got to think of all your clients, all your users. Um, I have some projects that still have IE8 requirements. Very frustrating that you have to still write code that deals with that, especially when you're dealing with a lot of um, SAS, uh, a lot of JavaScript that does not always function well. Um, how many of you are Mac users? You have no excuse not to be checking the Internet Explorer. Go to modern.ie, get the virtual box or the VMware um, uh, uh, VMs for that, and start checking. Yes, it may eat up a little bit of your hard drive space, but that's okay. Your clients will thank you, your users will thank you, and uh, it'll make you a better developer at the end of the day. And yes, I know Edge is coming out, but with everything else that every other browser that Microsoft has put out, we're not guaranteed that it's still going to work right. I won't believe it until I see it, so sorry. Um, test on all the things. So while I'm developing, I test on multiple devices with multiple OSs. I have, I have an Android tablet, I have an iPad, I have iPhone 5C, I have an older iPhone 4, I have a Windows machine, I have a now in Raspberry Pi running Ubuntu, and then my v VMs. Um, this allows me to see what the user sees and experience what they experience. I use tools such as XIP.io and Browser Sync uh, with Vagrant to test against my local development environment on multiple devices. We, also, we should also test against multiple connection speeds. So this makes me think of another situation Adam and I were talking about. So at home, I have a 50 by 5 connection. Really beautiful. It's fast. Not all my users have that connection. Um, contrary to what we think, there are still people that have dial-up. There are still people that have, um, that their only option is 3G on their phone. We have to test against those speeds. One of the cool things about a performance budget is you can do that. You can test against certain speeds. If you go to like web page test, you can choose the speed 
um, that it's going to perform that test against. So we need to start testing against multiple connection speeds also, not just how things are on your site, uh, on your connection at home. So XIP.io, has anybody ever heard of this? Okay, so this is from the people who put out Basecamp. And what it is, is a domain name that provides Wildcard DNS for any IP address. Um, an example is your domain .192.168.1.100.xip.io. So what this is, is the your domain is this is what your local development environment domain is. This IP address is the IP address of the computer you're currently on. And then xip.io. So it goes out, reroutes that, and you can now access this on any device that's on the same network that that computer's on. Uh, we at Tenet work with a vagrant environment called VVV. There's built-in support for this. Uh, it was added quite a bit of ways back. Now, when I say build-in support, that doesn't mean it's going to work for the local development uh, instance that you set up. There's still work to be involved in that. One of the things you have to do is get into your Nginx um, file. This is a scary thought for some people but it's really not hard to deal with. Server name, local dev, asterisk, local dev, that way if I'm dealing with multi-site, and then I can set this up. Local, dot, all these little D pluses, this is looking for the uh, IP address, dot XIP, dot IO, dollar sign. Um, if you go to my website, I have a tutorial on how you can set this up using VVV, step by step, with files that you can just pull in off Git with some, with some gist. Pretty easy to do, I use this quite a bit. Um, Works really well. The other option I use is browser sync. Now, these two options, the reason I have two, xip.io versus browser sync, is xip.io, when I'm dealing with a large project with multiple developers where I may just be primarily working on front end for theme, but they're working on plugins, this becomes a better resource for me um, because I don't have to deal with putting browser sync set up in every uh, grunt file. This is set up in my uh, Vagrant instance, it's in my Nginx file, I'm good to go. But if I'm dealing with just a theme, I'll use browser sync. This allows you to keep multiple browsers and devices in sync when building websites. Uh, browser sync.io, uh, there's a lot of confusion on setup for this. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of, a, little bit of information here and then I'm going to be writing a uh, blog post on my blog this week on how you can set this up using Grunt. Um, it's pretty easy, works really well. Uh, browser sync. So we add in a browser sync task. I say dev, and it's looking for the browser sync files. That is the, the link to a CSS file, and then my domain. Your domain.dev, watch task. I am watching my, um, my watch task that's built into my, my um, Grunt file. Pretty easy to do. And then I run, I do like a grunt local. That runs up my watch task and my browser sync. And it opens up a browser for me. And, um, and then I can open up that same link on any of my other site, uh, any of my other devices. Because what happens is in your terminal, it's going to give you the URL that you will navigate to. And then I do this, grunt register task local. I say pull my default, which is all my CSS, my JavaScript. Do run browser sync and then run my watch task. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. That's all. This is going to be the situation with any of these. You have to be on the same ne network um, because it's going to be looking within the network. Because you're going to be navigating to um, either like a local host with a port or a um, IP address. Yeah. It would. It'd be really great if we could do it with, <laughs> without having to do that. We hadn't reached that point. You can also use something like um, Ghost Lab as an option. But the two options I just showed you, they don't require me to spend money. So I love that. Ghost Lab's awesome, though. And it has a lot of these features built in. So online tools. Um, tools such as webpagetest.org, Google's P uh, PageSpeed Insights, and SiteSpeed allow us to measure performance in live environments. We can also set a performance budget and track against it. Um, another great test site that I've been using is what does my site cost.com. Has anybody ever used that? It's actually, it's, it, it can actually hurt your feelings a little bit because you go run it and basically what it does is it will give you an insight 
and to what it costs for someone to view your site on mobile networks around the world. And you're looking at you know, what it costs in America, you're like, this is awesome. And then you go look at a country where people are paying per gig or even sometimes in some situations per meg, and you're realizing that the site that you've developed is costing them a lot of money, which means they're probably not going to visit your site. So I encourage you to use tools like this when, you, um, when you're developing. Uh, it's .com. What does my, what does my site cost.com? So these are the online tools I said I use. Uh, Google PageSpeed Insights, webpagetest.org, and sitespeed.io. Um, Google PageSpeed Insights is probably the one that most of your clients would use. It gives a good little like score, and let's be honest, we all like to get a score, right? We're all, we all have, most of us, like we have some type of competitive nature, and we want to get that 100. Um, if you were to look at my site right now, it's not going to have that 100, because I've got some plugins that are loading up stuff. I'm getting ready to fix those issues. Um, but my personal CSS that I've written, it's been prioritized. Um, the awesome thing about Google PageSpeed Insights is it gives you a score from mobile and desktop. But on mobile, one thing it does that I really like is it gives you a user experience score. So it tells you that you've got a 96 of a 100 possible with your user experience. And then it, it, it defines the things that are user experience issues, such as tap targets being way too close together, um, things like that. So run tests like this. And then webpagetest.org. Uh, this allows you to put in a URL, run a test on your site. You can choose the type of browser. You can choose a location, which would be a server location. And then you can also choose the speed that it's going to check it at. And you can choose how many continuous tests are going to be run on it. So you can say, okay, I just want to do one, or I want to do six. And it's going to tell you what, it, what the, what the uh, load time is for the first test and then all subsequent tests. But it doesn't just stop at saying your site loads at this. It tells you how long it takes before it starts making DNS calls, how long it takes for your site to render, how long it takes for your site to paint. And then it gives you this timeline and a breakdown of everything that is loading on your site. And that is scary in itself at times when you realize that I've got like 150 images loading on my site. Um, and another cool thing it is, you have a little checkbox that you can check and say, I would like a video of what the user experiences. And you can watch that video of how that site loads on that, that uh, browser at that speed and um, on the type of, um, at that server location. So I really like that feature because it gives me real insight as to what's going on outside of what I'm doing in my development environment. Um, so I would encourage you to use that. And then SiteSpeed.io. Now SiteSpeed.io, you can run some tests on their site, but this, they also have some grunt tasks and some gulp tasks that you can install. And you can interact with PageSpeed Insights and web page tests. You can put in API keys and you can run local grunt tasks against this before things actually ever hit a live server. So I encourage you to look at things like this. Check out some online tools. Use your browser. Let it become your friend. Uh, test all the things. This is where normally you like put that all the things meme up. Test all the things. Don't write code without testing it and pushing it. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, the time to first buy. So that's the time to, um, I'm trying to make sure I state this correctly, because it's not the time to first render, but it's the time between when your browser first, like it first makes that call, it goes to, if you're doing HTTPS, it verifies that. It's that time to first byte, the time to first, the, that um, files are first being loaded and uh, parsed on your site. I believe that's the, correct definition for it. The first byte yeah. The yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that varies per if you so I was when I was um, making a transition on my site for hosting I was using um, a company I'm not going to name because I'm not going to 
go out and shame somebody. But that time the first bite was like four seconds, and it was driving me nuts because I knew that my code was better than that, and there was nothing that should be blocking it. I moved to another hosting provider where totally unmanaged, and I set up my own server and set up how I wanted it set up. And now that time to first byte is like 0.2 seconds, which means it's processing quick. So in some instances, it's out of your control. If you're, it, particularly if you're using a shared hosting environment. Um, and a lot of companies, that's what they're having to use. That's what they can afford. That's what the everyday person can use. I mean, honestly, who wants to try to have to deal with setting up your own server? Who wants to deal with configuring Nginx or Apache? So that, that it's not always the code that you write that is that blocker. Sometimes it is out of your control. It could be a situation where you are on a, you are on a shared hosting environment and um, there are also 70 to 100 other sites that are being loaded on that too. Especially some of these where they say, hey, you can host unlimited domains and unlimited um, bandwidth and unlimited uh, disk space. And so somebody buys that and they're sell reselling hosting for $5 a pop and they're paying $5 for it and there's all these sites. So that's a good question though. Any other? Yes, sir. Can you talk about caching uh, any experience you've had with plugins or technologies that have been helpful? So um, I'll actually bring up a reference here. Let me get back here. So I just did a demo for dealing with the critical rendering path style sheets um, for our internal front end team. One of the first questions I got is like, is that CSS file going to be cached? The one that's being loaded, um, load CSS. I'm like, oh, go to my website, uh, load the site up, go to subsequent page, look at your network resources, you're going to see this is caching. So just FYI, this will be cached. Um, caching wise, um, so if I have the opportunity to use Nginx um, and environment I can control, I'm, I like Memcache. And then there's a back cache plugin you can use. Um, Mark Jaquith has a new plugin out that it's, a, it's like a helper for um, caching. And I cannot remember what it's called right off the top of my head. I've got it on my site. But then you also can utilize things like um, W3 Total Cache, some of the other plugins that are available on like WordPress.org. But if you do that, make sure you set it up correctly. Because while they can be a help, they can be a hurt if you don't set it up like it should be. If you look and you dig through the, um, like W3 Total Cache, I use that on my personal site because I'm using Amazon's um, uh, web services for CDN. So I'll allow that to interact to pull files. But it also will give you, if you're using um, Apache, it will give you the, the, the information you need to put in your, um, your HTTP access files. In some instances, it will do it for you. It also will give you the information that you need to put in your Nginx uh, comp file. So those things are very important. Caching is as good as how you set it up in the long run. Um, you can, it can be as granular as allowing a, you can do a, let a plugin do it, or you can make it as gran granular as you going the extra mile and caching certain files for certain hours or certain day times. So it's kind of a very broad range thing. Yeah, so. I would like to give you a better answer to that, but it, it's, 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 it's a little bit difficult because there's so much. But see me afterwards. Um, I'll give you my business card, and I'll email you some links to even better resources. Yeah. Cool. Five minutes. Okay. Any other questions? We have five minutes to go. I'm, I'm glad uh, Jason's helped me out with that because I said I'm very verbose. I like to talk. Um, so I always need that helper. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Different screen resolutions. How do you deal with that for speed? Uh, I like to use Picture Fill, personally. I like to use Picture Fill and um, set up either the picture element or use the image source set type option and load up different image sizes based on screen resolution. There is a great plugin that's available on .org from the um, the responsive image. Um, group or community group and it's got picture fill built into it it's got the newest version of picture fill and it will do all that for you 
and as personally as what I'm using on my site, and then I go and I DQ their JavaScript file and throw it in the footer. And but it works really well. What's the name of that footer? Um, yeah, I think it is. It just it's resp responsive images. Um, see me afterwards. I'll give you, tell you exact name of it because I can pull it up in the browser and show you. Yeah, but that's what I would do. And, and so I do. There's there's another cool um, JavaScript um, plugin called um, Lazy Load XT. And with Lazy Load XT, you can lazy load your images, iframes, widgets. It also has a responsive images option too. Uh, we're actually using that on a project right now. So we're getting the benefit of lazy loading images, any other type of content that we want to lazy load, such as um, videos, with a um, responsive image option too. It works really well. Yes, sir. I'm not sure of that because the the I, I haven't read that so I can't speak, but I don't know why they couldn't index it because its content is still on your site. All that la lazy loading is doing is allowing it to become visually visible and loading that resource. Like the link is still there to it, but it's not actually lo loading that resource until the time is there, until it's ready for it. So I, I can't speak as to if that's the actual case as far as what Google's concerned with it. Now, I could see that. I could see that being a ca an instance. Um, let me give you my card, and I would, if you have that link, I would love to see it. Because that, that's something we would have to think about. Definitely. But, I mean, at the same time, lazy loading can be your friend if you're dealing with content. I think, uh, personally, like my site, and then client sites that I'm working on, we have loads of lazy loading set up, especially if you're dealing with sites that are for publishers where they're loading up a ton of content, a ton of images. The image does not load either, in some cases, which I don't always like this case from a user experience perspective, as the image like fades in as you initially start seeing it. So I like to say, let's, fade, let's start that load 50 seconds or, or 50 pixels before it becomes visible in the browser. And so the user knows no different, but from the side of development and systems, we're not loading up the content initially. Any other questions? Yes. What, what have you found to be best practice that someone's struggling with right now is um, dealing with the stuff that plugins are loading into my head? Like, what's the best practice to get? Like, is it just to move it all to the footer? Like, how? As far as like JavaScript yeah. and CSS? It, it, so I say that I wish. Um, Developers would put all JavaScript in the footer, but the, the truth is that cannot always be the case. There are some files that need to be in the header. Like we need that in order for content to work. But what I'm doing um, is, and I wouldn't say do this for a client unless it's something that you've tested thoroughly, is I set up from like my site, I have a, what I call a core plugin. And that core plugin, I'm looking for the CSS and JavaScript files that are being pulled from plugins, and I'm dequeuing them and deregistering them, and then I'm loading them uh, with this load CSS option where that link is being developed and added. And then JavaScript files, I'm putting it in WP footer. Because if I don't, like I said, if I don't need it, why do I need it to be there to be parsed? And if it already is being loaded in the footer, then I'm just using like script loader tag and I'm asyncing it so that it does not be considered render blocking. But it's, you have to test all that thoroughly. I test all my stuff very thoroughly locally before I ever let it touch the server. And I have a staging environment too. Sorry, it's not like this is what you should do. It's a case-by-case -case basis. And you, you run the risk of also, why I say thoroughly testing, you run the risk of breaking something. So you have to make sure you test it thoroughly. Any other questions? Oh, and with that, the reason you want to test it thoroughly, and it, it could be an issue, if you ever deactivate that plugin, plugin and forget that you've done that, now you've got a 404 possible issue too. So, okay. Thank you very much.